Hi everyone, welcome to the One DEI Thing. DEI stands for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. I am Natasha Green, the project lead for this series, and I am super excited that you decided to join or listen to this on replay. Shout out to the folks who will be replaying this. You get mad love from me also. This is an AnitaB.org webinar series in which men share one thing they did to improve their company's culture. Absolutely. There are probably tons of things these individuals are doing, but I decided one thing would be enough in the time we have together. All speakers wanted to create a culture so that employees feel that they can grow, learn, and have equal opportunity for advancement in their highest individual potential, no matter who they are, where they're from, what their race is, how they look, or even how old they are. Each speaker believes that an individual potential should not be restricted because of discriminatory practices. This initiative stems from AnitaB.org's mission, where we envision a future where the people who imagine and build technology mirror the people and societies for whom they build it. We do a lot of work connecting, guiding, and inspiring women and our allies to ensure anywhere you see technology being built, you will also see an equal representation of women building and leading those technological products or services and getting paid fairly. I believe in order for this to happen, Many individuals at all levels in the organization will have to advocate and do their part, wherever they are in the organizational chart. That person can shift an organization's culture to be inclusive and a place where everyone feels like they belong and that they are reaching their full potential. So I welcome you to the NeedaB.org's The One DEI Thing. Today we welcome Matt to The One DEI Thing. Matt is a close friend um, and a confidant he definitely was the person who got me started on my first event a couple of years ago when I knew I wanted to do something to help in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space and allowing men to feel like they can lead and be a voice in this initiative. And so we have known each other for a long time. But a little bit about Matt. For over 15 years, Matt has been applying behavioral science to practical problems, from startup exits to the Fortune 500 to an array of pro-social side projects. He was one of the first behavioral scientists to leave academia and work in industry. Along his journey, he has given hundreds of talks on the science of behavior change at the UN, South by Southwest, and beyond. He is currently the healthcare industry's first chief behavioral officer at Clover Health, a Medicare Advantage plan changing the model of insurance by changing behavior where he directs one of the world's largest behavioral science teams, combining qualitative researchers, quantitative researchers, and project managers. His side projects consistently focus on the unrepresented, like GetRaised.com, which has helped underpaid women ask for and earn over 3.1 billion in salary increases. He also hosts ad hoc mentor meetings um, at his space, um, which I went once or twice or three times. Um, anyway, in his new book, Start at the End, How to Build Products That Create Change, he details a science-based process to create behavior change that can be implemented in organizations of any size and industry. This book is filled with colorful examples from his own work, and yes, it um, has curses in it, <laughs> but the book is approachable. Um, it guides others on how they can put behavior back to the center of everything we build. So thank you, Matt, for being here. Welcome. Sure. So uh, I wasn't planning to speak today, and I, even if I did, I wouldn't have slides. Um, and so thanks, Neil, for, for being so prepared and awesome. I could certainly talk about a lot of things. The most recent thing that, um, as Natasha mentioned, you know, I've been doing this work a long time. I have, as a scientist, like, you know, I think one of the things that's important in DNI is trying to bring uh, whatever your specific skill set is. Right, and so by training, I'm a behavioral scientist. So I look at and understand. And so I uh, recently, there's an interesting um, effect that we're all aware of of men being, uh, let's say, overconfident in the workplace. Um, but at least, but but sort of feeling comfortable taking risks is probably the more parsimonious version of how we say it. Uh, and so I was really interested in, when we talk about behavior change, we talk about behaviors, 
We talk about promoting pressures, things that make something more likely, and inhibiting pressures, things that make something less likely. So I got a little bit preoccupied with sort of an interesting question, which was, is the reason, are, are us, they have a, believe that those risks have a high likelihood of paying off, right? So sort of a promoting pressure or that they feel that there are less consequences for those risks, right? So an inhibiting pressure, uh, like so lower inhibiting pressure or greater promoting pressure. Um, and so what I did was I did a survey and and I don't have all this prepared because I wasn't ready to write it up and I wasn't ready to talk about it today, but we can. Um, so what we did was we actually uh, took a bunch of white dudes and, and actually uh, a diverse sample um, so that we could compare the white dudes to other folks, other slices. Uh, and we gave them two short surveys. And one of the surveys um, is about uh, something we call workplace safety, psychological safety. So basically the idea that um, if I take risks, is that supported in the workplace? So meaning, is this an okay place for me to be wrong? You know, it has items that are about, um, you know, specifically, is this an okay place to be wrong? Do I feel like other people will judge me harshly when I fail? You know, other kinds of sort of like negative things around risk taking and, and sort of mistakes. And the other thing we gave was a workplace competency scale. So this is a, a so-called workplace self-efficacy. This is basically how confident am I in my abilities in the workplace, that the things that I do will go well. It's sort of, you might think of it as the inverse of the imposter syndrome, right? So if the imposter syndrome is, I'm really worried that I don't belong here and that, and every, that everything I do will go to shit, like, you know, this is sort of the inverse idea of like, no, I'm really feel self-efficacious self in the workplace. I can rely on my skills. I'm confident in the things that I do. Um, so again, roughly the sort of like inhibiting pressure, promoting pressure problem. So any predictions? Are white dudes more willing to take risks in the workplace because of lowered inhibiting pressure or greater promoting pressure? Come on, folks. This is interactive. Come off mute. Give me your prediction. So ask the question again while people decide to come off mute. So, so again, are men more likely to take risks in the workplace because A, they are more confident in their abilities that the bets will pay off in a positive way, or B, they believe that they exist in a safer workplace where, uh, they're, where taking risks uh, is less risky for them because uh, they have psychological safety from their team, the people who support their risks. I say, A, hey, what are y'all saying? Y'all can put it in the chat too. My chat's open, but I'm thinking, we want payoff. You think it's B, okay? I say C, that they don't <laughs> think they're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, so again, it's not about being right or wrong. It's about whether or not they feel comfortable taking risks, right? We know men are more likely to take risks. Are they more likely to take a risk because they're more confident that the, that the odds are good that they'll, so, so I think what you're saying, sorry, I missed yeah, I guess I'm, say, I'm saying, I'm saying a, because yes, but I really don't think, yeah, they're very surprised when they're wrong. Yes. Got it. So you think they're going to have higher workplace self-efficacy. They're going to say, I am very confident in my abilities. I know my job. I'm super good. And the reason that I can take risks is because I'm super good and those risks are going to go well because I'm right when I bet. They're not yes. bets. I'm right. Yes. Okay? Pamela, I saw you come off mute. What's your thought? Yeah, the same. A. I would say A. They're just super confident, <laughs> right or wrong. Overconfident in their abilities. <laughs> Does anyone disagree with that? This is interesting. It depends on the sample size. Um, I would like to know the sample size the survey was conducted. Okay. Uh, now you're getting into like, I wasn't ready for write up. I believe this was <laughs> 500 people. Uh, I believe it was 500 people between the ages of 20 and 60 still working in the United States, in the United States. So between 20 and 60, ages between 20 and 60, currently working 500 people in the United States. Statistically significant and, and distributed as best we could across the population curve. Um, 
also like I would like to pose this question and why I'm not giving an A and B an answer. It's because of the background I'm coming from saying that if we are taking the 500 sample size across the United States, demographically, the way um, men are raised is completely different. And if we see the answers, it will be completely different. So for example, if a man grew up in southern part of Mississippi, if a man uh, grew up in, um, in, and I'm talking about white men, uh, grew up in California, they will have completely different uh, background and environment. So that's why no, it's, I don't I like think it. so in B. I yes. like this. We're getting into a good place here. So uh, if it were true that men were truly individually different, then we shouldn't get a no result, right? There should be no significant result because there would be too much individual variance. I will say that we did get significant results. So even though they are distributed across the country, men are similar enough that there was a main effect difference between white men versus everyone else. So people of color and women versus white men, there was a main effect difference between the group. And the answer is C, both. So I was getting there. <laughs> so, it's, a setup. <laughs> it's a setup. Men are both demonstrate higher workplace self-efficacy. So they both believe they are more confident in their abilities in the workplace. And they have a greater sense of psychological safety. So meaning they believe they face fewer repercussions from failure than do women and people of color. However, of the two, it is the latter not the former that was larger. So there was the larger difference. Uh, so men had higher workplace self-efficacy significant, statistically significantly than people of color and women. However, that effect size was smaller than they literally have higher psychological safety. And so they feel like it is okay for them to make mistakes. So what this suggests is, uh, that, that if we want to, I mean, and, and taking risks in the workplace is associated with, with advancement, right? So if we want to help women and people of color advance, we both need to concentrate on making sure that they feel confident in their abilities, but also create a sense of psychological safety. And if we can only do one of those and concentrate, it really is on creating a sense of psychological safety, that it is okay and acceptable in the workplace to make mistakes and that they will not be harshly judged for that. Here's the problem. The problem is we know that is actually not true. So women and people of color are more likely to be harshly punished for the same mistakes than their male counterparts. And so it is not that, you know, this is like, one of the things I don't love about, about um, this is too much of a Monday for me. Uh, one of the things I don't love about the imposter syndrome is it sort of seems to blame the victim. Right. It sort of says like, well, Natasha, if Natasha doesn't think she's good enough, like Natasha should just buck up and believe she's good enough. Right. Uh, I don't love that victim blaming. This is not merely some psychological effect. People of color women are correctly perceiving that they have greater, that they are more likely to be punished in the workplace and so are entirely rationally not taking risks because they will in fact be punished for them. And so the, uh, if we want to further uh, women of color de-risk their mistakes, we need to create environments in which they are not unfairly punished for taking the same risks that white men would. And so that is the latest research out of my uh, personal lab of one, um, uh, and I do have to write it up and such, but that is, that is the, the world premiere of, of we need to actually make the workplace, it's not just making the workplace feel safe, it needs to actually be safe for women and people of color, and that is the largest, that, that will have the highest DNI return if what we care about is getting them to take professional risks that pay off for them. Ta-da! Yeah, absolutely. So really forgive the fact that I'm off video, Matt. I was just thinking sometimes my my video was like like making it skip because I don't know, or just there's overload on the systems, right? But a question I have for you, now that a lot of people are now work from home, this concept of being safe, right? Do you think being safe 
is does it is it a place or is it more so as a psychological sort of in like in our mind space that we we now all have to work on right yeah so so specifically i was talking about psychological safety um this is a construct that so when google google surveyed all of their high performing teams um and or all of their teams in general, but then looked at what makes teams high performing. And um, so they looked across a wide spectrum of, of teams. Um, and the they found, I believe it's seven or five characteristics of high performing teams, but the number one most predictive far and away, uh, best one was psychological safety. And so let me, if you give me one, uh, uh, second survey let me actually pull up the survey and i can give you some of the uh, i'll give you the items that we used to measure psychological safety which will give you i think a better sort of loose construct of what it, what i mean by these two different surveys since i'm talking fast and apparently i have extra time no, um, no. so just bear with me for one second i'm going to I'm well, going to pull up we'll, the actual uh, survey here. Yeah, we'll bear with you. But I think what I'm, I was also trying to angle at is like, now we're supposed to like this work from home, right? And psychologically, even being in the room of someone you feel intimidated, like with being around, I don't know if that intimidation still, you know, perpetrates in this, uh, uh, this whole, I'm in my room by myself, right? <laughs> so... <clears throat> will I now be more willing to say different things because I'm in the room by myself versus if I was in the room with these other individuals, right? Because so, there's, there's something called aura. And I don't know if the aura of people aggression or people minimizing you is still extended through this like internet, right? So I, I guess it's like a deep yeah. questions I have to unwrap. <clears throat> yeah, so if the question is, um, is psychological safety greater on remote teams? So the evidence is sort of mixed, right? Um, you know, one of the things that psychological, uh, the psychological safety of teams does, you know, psychological safety comes from a variety of places. And one of the places that, that tends to help it is knowing a lot about other people, right? And so when you know a lot about other people, you tend to be more willing uh, to accept their foibles, right? And so psychological safety tends to go up. Um, the, the, the sort of contra theory is it's harder for people to speak up, right? This is a great example, right? Like, you know, I have to kind of pay attention to who goes off mute. I have to pause. I have to make time for them to talk right? There's like a weird sort of effect that happens. Um, and so I think that like, um, it is, it remains to be seen. And look, we're in an unprecedented experiment now, right? Like remote work, weirdly, has been, uh, you know, sort of, lots of people have a hybrid solution. So they're sort of remote some of the time. Um, and it's never been practiced at scale, at the sheer scale of happening right now. So for the first time, we may actually have the data to be able to see what of those play out. I don't think, I think the jury's still out. So it's hard to know how this will affect psychological safety. So uh, in terms of the questions, so a good example of a psychological safety question, this would be positively coded. So meaning higher answers would mean there was greater psychological safety. People at work are able to bring up problems and tough issues, right? Um, no one at work would deliberately act in a way that undermines my efforts, right? Um, a reverse coded item would be like, it is difficult to ask other people at work for help, right? So those are psychological safety type questions, right? Um, uh, workplace self-efficacy questions would be more like, no one at work, uh, sorry, uh, thanks to my resourcefulness, I know how to handle unforeseen situations at work, right? I can remain calm when facing difficulties at work because I can rely on my abilities. Working with members of my team, my unique skills and talents are valued and utilized, right? Those are all sort of positive statements, which I think, you know, Wendy and others were getting at as the sort of like, oh, the overconfidence of men. 
So I have to say, this was my naive theory going in too. I thought men would just be, you know, they would be like, ah, you know, I like, I can remain calm because I can rely on my abilities. I'm just super smart and super capable. And so like, that is why I can take risks because my abilities are so high. So I was a little surprised that psychological safety um, uh, was as prevalent of a factor um, uh, uh, as prevalent as a factor as it was. Uh, agree, Wendy, that you know when we're talking white male here. You're right. I'm talking cis white male. I didn't actually measure sexual orientation in this because I'm limited to the number of questions I can actually ask, and that so I get. Uh, demographic, they give you demographic questions for free, but I don't believe, you know, that's actually interesting. Uh, let me look. Let's find out. Um, uh, can I get, uh, hold on. if I do this, what happens? And, and while yeah. Matt is looking for that, I do want to put it out there and I'm going to talk to my leaders. His book, I'm really interested in his book to you like and how does that and uh, you can answer it after wendy's question can we start at the end also with dei initiatives I, I think that's an interesting thing i was thinking about and i'm looking forward to seeing how to like blend the two okay but continue yeah so so i don't get sexual orientation in their default demographics and i ran out of questions to ask it because you only get to ask 10 questions um, without spending a gajillion dollars uh, so you're right i i suspect that we are talking here about cis white men um, based on what I know from previous research, but I can't specifically look at it in this data set. It's a limitation of the data set uh, since I have to pay for the shit myself. Uh, <laughs> um, imagine what you could do if you had psychological safety, assuming you don't already have it. Yeah, I mean, so I think the, the obvious next step from something like this, you know, I would, the purpose of the research for me was to try and direct people's attention towards a problem space. So meaning, I think one of the things that's gonna happen at DEI is like, everything's a problem, right? Like we need people to be, to have higher workplace self-efficacy. We need psychological safety. We need better, you know, behavior in meetings. We need all of these things, right? And so I think one of the useful things that we all can do in research is to try and find where are the places that are likely to have, that are likely fulcrums, right? Where effort will have differential differential um, sort of impact or exponential impact. And I, and I hope at least what this research would suggest to me is investments in psychological safety are likely to be a place where there's um, differential impact. So then the question becomes, well, how do we create psychological safety? And in some, you know, you can sort of get to some of the, I mean, I can talk about the research there. You can sort of get to some of it just by listening to the questions, right? So no one at work would deliberately act in a way that undermines my efforts. Well, what things can you do to make sure that people know that that isn't true, that, that, that people, or is true, depending on how you phrase it, right? That people will support them at work and will not deliberately undermine them, right? Can you do more? Um, one of the things that, that we work a lot on my team on is, is um, revealing motivation, right? So when you do something, you always say why you did it, right? So meaning I blanked because I believed blank or because I thought blank, right? And what that does is, let's say Natasha and I are on a team and I do something that kind of fucks up Natasha's process. If, I, if all Natasha knows is Matt did something that fucked up my life, it is easy to ascribe that to I have a vengeance against Natasha or I want to undermine her or there's a motivation behind it. But if we can qualify that and we can say, oh, Matt did this thing that fucked up Natasha's project, but he did it for these reasons that he didn't realize he was a fucking up Natasha's project. He did it for these reasons that were motivated other than, other than having anything to do with Natasha or, you know, still like, or it was a calculated thing. I knew this was going to fuck up Natasha's project, but it was better for the overall thing that we were doing. Yeah. Right, and so it was sort of the, the like the right thing to do in the bigger picture. But I acknowledge and recognize, Natasha, I really screwed you over, and I'm sorry about that. It was right in the bigger picture, but I, I recognize, and that's something that, that we work a lot with managers to do. Right, yeah. is you know, um, yeah. one of the worst things is right to have your product deprioritized. Right, so you're working on a project, you put your heart and soul into it, and then all of a sudden it gets killed. And that, if you look statistically, like 
you know, how people interpret the killing of their project is a huge part of feeling safe, right? Um, and so if you realize, if, if your leader does a good job of saying, I killed your project, not because it wasn't good, not because you did a bad job, but because this externality changed in, you know, this thing shifted in the market or we need to do this the different thing as a team. It's a lot easier to, for Natasha to be like, oh yeah, I get that. Like, I understand I'm part of the team. I understand how she might've shifted, right? Whereas if I just say, Natasha, your thing is, is, is killed and Matt, your thing gets to proceed. Well, now it sure as shit feels like, yeah. right? Natasha's being undermined. Um, and so I think there are tons of things that we can do to create more psychological safety. Um, there's tons out there. Google's written extensively about it, right? Um, rather than hear me drone on about it, right? There's a ton of expertise from, from folks about, about how to create psychological safety. But I think the overall message is, at least from my perspective, it looks like the, the best bet you can, the best bet you can be making right now is working with your team to figure out how to create more psychological safety. And to Natasha's point, remote might be a way to do that because it gives everybody seeing everybody's cat butt right wander across the street. everybody's seeing everybody's you know laundry in the background and you know everybody's hearing everybody kids kids scream scream bloody murder at them uh you know i disappeared for a few you know natasha covered me for a second while i disappeared here because my son was yelling at his grandfather right like you know allowing those personal things to seep through you know creates a greater sense of psychological safety so that was an interesting pivot point now is the now is the moment to work on it um, it's just a matter of, you know, we need to sort of do the work. Thank you so much. I don't know if anyone, you have two minutes y'all before I just like really, uh, you know, thank Matt for that. And I think what I really like is how you phrased it. Like, I don't know if they teach us in managerial school, but just to be able to say like, yes, you know, um, I killed your project, but when we look at where we were going strategically and the coronavirus, like right now, the priority is A, B, and C but then that still makes the person feel valued because I guess what the manager did not realize was that that person probably stayed up late trying to do your project management plan, right? Creating all this documentation and it was sponsored and it was authorized. And then you're like, no, absolutely not. But I think that wording in it itself is like, oh yeah, my director cares for me or you know, my, my boss, whoever it is, cares for me. So um, there's one more minute. <clears throat> Sorry, I've been sick. There's one more minute. Um, if any other questions before we let Matt hang out with, we call him Pooh Bear, right? <laughs> I, I, um, I, have actual name, I do not call him Pooh Bear. His name is Bear. It's his literal name. His name is actually Bear. It's Bear Sugar uh, is my son's name. I got Sugar Bear, Sugar Bear the baby. And uh, who, who would like me to go uh, do other things right now? I do have a question. Okay. Yes, <laughs> Hi, Matt. This is Baby. Um, so my question to you is, um, is there a... Uh, like two section to a question. Is there any correlation between self-esteem, which leads to self-confidence? Um, and I would like to uh, also circle back to your question that um, what should be done to in, um, encourage women who are struggle uh, sometimes with, many times with self-esteem, which also, you know, self-esteem actually enhances your self self-confidence. Thank you. Yeah, so um, uh, on the first question, yes, self-confidence and self-efficacy are correlated. Self-efficacy is maybe the more updated version of self-confidence, um, but I think that I think if you read the self-efficacy questions, you would read it as self-confidence. And so then if the question is, well, how do we make uh, women more self-confidence, uh, self-confident, rather than, you know, that's a, that's a, I can give a whole nother hour on that. Um, the, the best, you know, a lot of this research um, has been done by Carol Dweck, D-W-E-C-K, Dweck, Carol Dweck, um, out of Stanford, um, who's a social psychologist there. Um, and they have done a lot of interesting programs about how do you increase uh, self-efficacy. One of the, I mean, if we have two seconds, the three components that we really think about in terms of self-efficacy is, is really about attribution. Right, so when something goes wrong, do I generalize it? Do I uh, do I generalize it across topics? Do I generalize it across domains? Do I generalize it across time? Um, and do I recognize it as situational? So, meaning, I fail a test. Does that I fail a math test? 
Does that mean A, I'm gonna fail my English test too, right? B, does it mean I'll fail all math tests forever? And C, did I fail because I'm a bad person or did I fail because I didn't study enough and I didn't get enough sleep the night before? And so what we find is people have generally better self-efficacy when they understand that failures are situationally controllable, you can change your behavior and they will change, that they are localized, they, were, they're not, they don't mean you're bad at everything, they mean you're bad at that particular thing in that particular moment, right? that you won't be bad at it forever. And so I think encouraging those kinds of attributional styles can really help change uh, the equation on uh, 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 self-efficacy. Okay, so I have to let Matt go. <laughs> and I have to let people go. Um, we'll continue this conversation. You can find Matt on Twitter. And definitely, I'm going to try to figure out how to, you know, get his book. Or, we're going to do something. So keep your eye out when Matt's going to come on again, because y'all are going to find that um, just what he shares and how he shares is very valuable.